Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the University of Michigan Museum of Anthropological Archaeology Brownback Lecture Series. I'm John Cruz, a PhD student here at UMA, and a member of the Brownback Committee. It's my pleasure to introduce today speaker Dr. Gabriela Cervantes. Dr. Cervantes has a bachelor in licenciatura from the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú, master and PhD in anthropology from the University of Pittsburgh, where she is also a research associate. She has published on diverse topics such, such as gender, funerary practice, craft production, and urbanism on the north coast of Peru. Currently, she is a lecturer, a lecturer at the University Nacional Mayor de San Marcos in Lima, Peru. Today, she will be presenting his work entitled Demography and Segmentary Sociopolitical Integration in the City of Sikan, Peru. During the presentation, please type in your question in the Q&A box at the bottom. And at the end of the presentation, we will have, to time, we will have time to answer it. So thank you and please welcome Dr. Cervantes. Um, hi, good morning, greetings from Peru, um, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Brown Bag uh, series organized by the Museum of Anthropologi Anthropological Archaeology and the Department of Anthropology at the University of Michigan for their kind invitation. I'd like to thank the students and particularly my fellow Peruvian uh, congressional uh, student, John Cruz, I've known John for a while now. Uh, he was my right hand and during my dissertation field work uh, for which I'm so, so grateful. Um, so um, now I'm going to talk about uh, demography and segmentary sociopolitical integration in the city of Sikan. So let me um, share my screen with you. <clears throat> Okay, I think that's going well, right? <clears throat> um, so in, in this talk, I analyze the characteristics of social political integration in the city of Sikan by focusing on the uh, analysis of demographic patterns of the city. Um, given that interpretations about Sikan have been until now based mainly on the study of uh, monumental structures and ritual practices, in this talk, I provide evidence of permanent residential patterns using the density and spatial distribution of ceramics recovered systematically. Uh, results of the analysis show that uh, the city of Sikan had a low density uh, urban pattern extending over a large area with a total of eight demographic districts. This pattern, I argue, provides evidence of uh, Sikan's segmentary sociopolitical integration format. Um, but before I start uh, talking about Sikan, I'd like to briefly talk about uh, cities and urbanism in general, um, if I may. Cities are at the center of political, economic, religious, and social life. Cities developed in different parts of the world independently, and yet um, diverse urban traditions share certain similarities in their layout and organization of space, such as open plazas and streets religious architecture in central locations, residential clusters of, or districts, and occupational specialization. Urban centers are not static, um, but our social formations manifest in a change in physical surrounding. They are not just the reflection of political and economic organization, but also reproduce and recreate such organizations. Child mentioned, uh, Gordon Child mentioned uh, years ago, more than 50 years ago, that the concept of the city is notoriously hard to define. And more than 50 years later, it seems that it's still the case. There are many discussions about where the city is and what a city should be, uh, but I'm not particularly interested in the discussion of what a city is, but what I find more interesting is what a city does. Cities are the home of uh, both elite and commoner residents and is where daily interaction, social segmentation and economic differentiation are manifested. Uh, this can be addressed by analyzing uh, demographic patterns. <clears throat> um, 
Archaeology then is particularly well suited uh, to study social relations um, in urban. Uh, to study social relations in urban environments, as it can trace long-term uh, trajectories of urbanism, uh, change in the relationship with political power uh, and statecraft. Uh, as an example, we can mention Mexico City and its long-term occupation and changes. Uh, as you can see in the picture, uh, there are several uh, the several faces of the Templo Mayor. Uh, and to the right, uh, you can see the colonial church and surrounding it all, it's the current city of uh, Mexico, Mexico de Efe. Um, urban formats and sociopolitical integration. So major urban formats range from uh, compact settlements with high population density to dispersed ones with low population density. Um, compact cities present high density um, residential occupations. They uh, have a dense structure or parts closely packed joint. This characteristic gives the city a clear boundary edge. In terms of uh, sociopolitical integration, compact cities leans to, uh, lean towards a unitary integration. As an example, uh, continuing in Mexico, we have Teotihuacan, of course. And in Peru, we also have compact cities as uh, such as Pampa Grande, uh, capital of the Mochi Five state, and Chan Chan, capital of the Chimu Empire. And in the middle, we have uh, the Sican polity. And uh, I'll be back to this um, later in the talk. Um, on the contrary, um, dispersed or garden cities uh, present open spaces separating residential architecture that is seen as indirect evidence of spatially restricted in field systems such as gardens and orchards located within a walking distance uh, from uh, residences. The dispersed uh, or garden city is characterized by an extended, relatively low density population in space between urban houses for agriculture. <clears throat> in terms of uh, social political integration, dispersed occupations lean, to, lean towards a uh, more segmentary integration. Um, people organized in low density agrarian communities uh, have created settlements of highly varied size and form spread over vast areas like Copan and Tikal in the Maya area and Angkor Wat in Southeast Asia, all former heartlands of their polities. This segmentary pattern has been found uh, in ethno-historical accounts uh, for the north coast of Peru. In her study of land use patterns in the Chicama Valley, Netherly finds that canal hierarchies were associated um, <coughs> excuse me, with um, hierarchies of uh, local polities or parcialidades, since canals were the boundaries of territories. Canals were managed by a segmentary organization with rights and responsibilities over the system. Uh, for the Chicama Valley, uh, Netherly finds that uh, the four main polities enjoyed access to up valley and down valley resources, including canals and lands associated with them. Moreover, uh, Susan Ramirez mentions that each parcialidad was responsible for the cleaning of their portion of the canals and that such event was uh, important in social and ritual terms. So, <clears throat> A useful heuristic exercise would be to uh, involve uh, analyzing uh, societal features without a continua, within a continua of variation that involves evaluating a polity in terms of the position it occupies along a series of thematically related continua of variation as Easton stated. The segmentary unitary continuum deals with the nature of um, an interrelation of a polity's constituent territorial units or district and their leaders. <coughs> um, political anthropologist suggests that the principles that govern political relations 
uh, within uh, and, and among districts in segmentary polities are based on ascription or kinship, societas. While in contrast, principles governing relations in unitary polities are contractual in nature, meaning civitas, following Durkheim's organic solidarity model. Um, <clears throat> The segmentary unitary continuum is particularly important for understanding socio-political integration at Sikan. Unlike other well-known centralized cities in the Andes, I propose that Sikan's socio-political organization lean towards the segmentary kind. As evidenced in the demographic patterns, civic ceremonial architecture distribution, metal and ceramic production, and wealth consumption. A segmentary or hegemonic political organization has a loose aggregation of districts, which are replications of one another in their political structure, with low degrees of centralization, differentiation, and integration, as mentioned uh, by Montmolan, Hearth, Hasek, Kent, Manzanilla, Smith, and others. Um, in these cases, there is no strong distinction between heartland, urban, and hinterland, uh, rural. Comparatively, other scholars have also pointed to the segmentary nature of state societies, such as in some Maya polities, like Arnold uh, Rice story and uh, Dr. Marcus uh, from uh, University of Michigan with her, a model of multiple nuclei. <clears throat> and some uh, Southeast Asian polities uh, by Juncker and Stark. So, um, back to Sikan. Um, the Sikan polity is a multi-valley state that developed mostly on the northern part of the north coast of Peru. The Sikan polity flourished between the Smoch states and the later Chimu empire. Thus, Sikan has been viewed as an important transitional society between these two very different overarching political systems. Um, the Sikan polity, also known as Lambayeque, developed mainly in the Lambayeque region. And you can see uh, in the slides, Sikan re in relation to Pampa Grande, uh, uh, Tucumé, and Chan Chan. <clears throat> um, here we have a, a um, general table, uh, chronological table, uh, comparing the general Andes uh, predification with uh, the La Leche Valley uh, predification, uh, where um, the core of the Sikan polity develops. Um, for reference. Um, so by the middle uh, Sikan period, the major center and capital was located in the Misla Leche Valley and had a large monumental core. Uh, the Sikan core is formed by a complex of, of several pyramidal mounds and platforms. Um, the Sikan archeological project led like by Shimada and colleagues postulate that the Sikan core, or as he calls it, this Sikan precinct, was the capital um, of the middle uh, Sikan state. And in red uh, there, uh, this is uh, the map that was uh, produced by the Sikan archeological project, I think in um, 1981. Um, and in red I've highlighted Wakaloro where the famous tombs of the uh, Lords of Sikan were uh, found. Um, here you can see a Wakaloro aerial picture uh, with the location of the East Tomb and its excavation during the 90s. And what came from that tomb? Uh, well, basically all these riches the, uh, and more. Um, this certification of the Sikan society is best known from funerary practices, notably the spectacular tomb, uh, uh, tomb of the Lord of Sikan, also known as, as the East Tomb. Each uh, pyramid would have functioned as the locus of public ceremony and ancestor veneration for the associated lineage involving public ceremonies and rituals according to Shimada, Matsumoto and others. Nonetheless, major aspects of Sikan remain virtually unknown. Uh, the first aspect is simply the size of the city and the extent of its area. The second uninvestigated uh, aspect concerns residential occupation itself. The current view of the Sikan core is a major uh, religious and craft production center with a relatively small group of elite residents overseeing production of valued goods in central workshops. Nonetheless, 
no elite nor commoner residencies have been located before my research. Uh, we did not we did not know uh, anything about the daily life of the Sikan people. Uh, where did they live? Uh, were there neighborhoods, uh, districts? How was the city organized? Um, so, demography um, uh, is is uh, key here. Since it refers to the spacing of people, and it is important because uh, the larger amounts of people living in closer proximity, the higher the number of social interactions. Uh, some of the material culture that has been used as population proxies in the past includes uh, counting radiocarbon dates, counting houses, counting sites, measuring areas of sites. Uh, and when county houses, for example, population estimates are obtained by multiplying the number of rooms or structures by a constant, as in the Santa Valley Regional Survey uh, researched by uh, Wilson. Population proxies are then assumed to be a direct, uh, directly proportional to the actual populations. <clears throat> Um, so in this talk, I use uh, an area density index. Um, and this method is a population proxy developed by Drennan and others um, from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, uh, where densities are of surface ceramics and their distribution are used to determine clusters of intensive social interaction. Um, for the purpose of acquiring residential population estimates, the materials recovered should have a residential provenience, uh, given the fact that domestic refuse or garbage is not deposited far from the residential places, as has been pointed out by Hayden and Cannon, Beck and Hill, among others. Uh, the accumulation of ceramic materials can be interpreted as evidence of residential units. Um, in order to uh, study demographic patterns at Sikan, a program of full coverage pedestrian survey was conducted, combined with intensive uh, surface collection of archaeological materials. Most survey studies in the Peruvian Andes uh, sought as the primary objective to register archaeological sites, uh, mostly based on visible surface architecture. Um, examples are um, uh, Wilson, Schauner, Billman's work. Uh, my approach was uh, different since it was aimed at the identification of uh, material remains as a product of human activity, particularly ceramics, regardless of the existence of visible architecture. The Sikan survey project, my project, um, covered most of the current Santuario Historico Bosque de Poma, um, the area is defined by topographic features such as the Cerro Salinas to the south, the Canal Pacora to the north and west, and the highway to Batan Grande to the east. <clears throat> and as you can see in the slide, this is, well, that's north, and uh, this is one kilometer. So in total, uh, we surveyed, we covered uh, 50 square kilometers. Um, the survey area had a total of 50 square kilometers, and it includes the La Leche River bottom, ravines, large sand dunes, and flat terrain. Uh, no monumental architecture was found uh, within a 10 kilometer radius outside of the research area. Uh, and this when coupled with a decrease in surface ceramic densities uh, could be an indication of city limits. Uh, the current limits of the Santuario, although arbitrary, seem to reflect a cultural boundary, that of what I propose is a large middle Sikan urban settlement. Uh, for comparison to the left, you have the map produced by the Sikan archaeological project uh, showing the Sikan core. Uh, and to the right, you have the current uh, Santuario Historico Bosque de Poma, um, which uh, are basically the limits of my research. And um, the Sikan core is located where the um, blank uh, um, rectangle is. 
<clears throat> so <laughs> this is how the research area looks from the ground. Um, you can see the wakas at the top, which I call the Sikan core, and I call all the surrounding area Greater Sikan. Uh, so the monumental area has received uh, much attention and sustained archaeological research through the past few decades. However, uh, the large seemingly urban sprawl uh, surrounding of the monumental area has received little to no attention. Most of the area, including medium and small mounds, is currently covered by dry forest vegetation and scrub that makes it invisible. And this is what I call Greater Sikan. Um, the dry environment, though, allows desert uh, adapted trees to grow, but not low lying vegetation like grass. So uh, dense vegetation is only uh, present near uh, water sources, which uh, there are many. <laughs> um, but overall, this allowed an overall good surface visibility under uh, the forest canopy. So over the forest canopy, this is all you see, but under all those trees, there is a city. Um, I implemented a program of intensive surface collection of archaeological materials and uh, survey units were polygons of an average of a quarter of a hectare from which a sample of surface materials was collected, as we can see um, in the images in the, uh, in the parts less <laughs> covered by vegetation <coughs> and canopy. Um, so, uh, a total of 2,787 collection lots with presence of archaeological materials were recovered over the whole survey area. Uh, different kinds of archaeological materials, uh, such as ceramics, uh, metals, lithics, and shell, were found regardless of architectural features. And I want to point out to the existence of canals, which are uh, natural quebradas that have been modified that cross over parts of the research area. This more meandering uh, part that you see here is the La Leche River, which comes here in the Google satellite image. But uh, what is not very visible in the left image is visible on the right image, and is these lines that are uh, natural quebradas or canals that are bringing uh, city that is vital to um, a large urban permanent center. <clears throat> um, two kinds of collection uh, units were taken for demographic purposes, general collections and systematic collections. Uh, uh, ceramic collections were made in sampling units of one meter square until reaching the minimum sample size of 25 shards. Um, the careful systematic collections of a uh, small number of uh, square meters provided a density value, which means shards per meter square. And that value was used to characterize the entire collection unit of a quarter of a hectare of size, ideally, not always, but ideally. Um, to calculate demography uh, from shard density uh, or the average number of people that live in certain period, I first developed a conversion factor uh, by drawing on the shared density of small residential mounds, which I call the Sikan Residential Mound Index. A sample of 43 residential mounds was chosen out of the more than 200 that were uh, registered over the survey. But these 43 was chosen, were chosen because uh, all had exclusively Sikan ceramics. Uh, their areas range between 200 and 400 meters squared. Um, well, residential mounds are indicators of structures, rooms, uh, an adjacent area of around a quarter of a hectare uh, was also assumed to be part of the outdoor activities taken by uh, uh, its residents, like the associated patios, for example. Next, uh, the area density index of the residential mounds and the adjacent areas were summed up for each case. Um, this number was divided by five, uh, since I assume that each one of these small residential mounds hosted at least a nuclear family of five people. Um, and here you can see an example of those mounds. Um, these mounds represent abund present abundant domestic refuse, uh, like domestic uh, ceramics, shells, lithics, and other items. 
So based on this evidence, these mounds were inferred to be uh, of residential uh, nature. Um, domestic uh, ceramics consisted mostly on cooking wares like pots and jars and large vessels for the storage of liquids and solids. And uh, to the left, we have a Sikan mound and to the right, we have a contemporary abandoned mound, uh, more or less to see how, how they look like. We know uh, the right one, we know uh, it was a house uh, actually. It's an abandoned contemporary house. <clears throat> it is important to note that other type of residences might have existed besides mounds, such as waterland up constructions. Uh, those remains no longer preserved. Um, these have been identified preliminarily as a known mound residences. Um, they consist of a discrete concentration of mostly utilitarian ceramics and lithics and um, shells, and most of the times. And these known mound houses are probably made of water and dog, can, keep, can be uh, interpreted as belonging to a lower social class due to their expedient construction and lower cost of materials. Uh, in the left, we have a um, picture taken by uh, Heinrich Brüning, and to the right, uh, it's a picture I took uh, in 2014, uh, really uh, in the close proximities of the uh, study area. So uh, a lot of similarities. <clears throat> uh, so in terms of the results, um, a dispersed uh, distribution of population was registered with several population concentrations that can be identified as demographic districts. Um, and after we did all the calculations that I've been talking about, all the densities, and uh, I'm sorry, this has been put it there. Okay. Um, then uh, you can see uh, the density area index. And uh, well, the calculations give that um, <clears throat> taking into account um, um, the Sikan Mound Index plus the um, uh, Waterland Dope and non mound residences. Uh, for the early Sikan, we have uh, in absolute uh, numbers uh, and absolute population estimates around 16,000 uh, 16, people. Um, for the middle Sikan period, we have around 19,000 to 20,000 people. Um, and for the late Sikan, we have uh, around 7,000 uh, people. So there's a diminished, but no, uh, it was not abandoned. Uh, so we can see that during middle Sikan numbers really go up and it, it, we're talking about it, 20,000 uh, uh, inhabitants in the city for the uh, middle Sikan period. <clears throat> so how do we see this in space? Um, um, we have, uh, we see different demographic, what I call demographic districts. Um, elevation in the following graphs uh, represent higher population densities, just like a higher altitude in a topographic map. And we see uh, basically uh, the eight uh, demographic districts that were identified. Um, and uh, the um, La Leche River goes uh, along this edge. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, um, so we're looking at the distribution of the early Sikan period here. Um, and I just want to call your attention to say that before this research, almost nothing was known about the early Sikan period in any valley. Uh, early Sikan, I consider, is key to understanding the Sikan polity. It is when substantial social changes are happening, setting up the stage for the middle Sikan polity to flourish. There is a dramatic increase in population and decentralization from the previous uh, Moche um, polity. Uh, the multiple nuclei pattern appears here, as you can see, there's not one, uh, a single uh, nuclei, but several. Uh, major districts in the north are districts A, B, and C. And uh, district D, while not large in population, is very important, as we'll see later. And it's here, and it, it appears in this period already. 
Um, by early Sikan, the Sikan core did not exist. Uh, it was built during middle Sikan. <clears throat> during middle Sikan period, all districts grow, um, particularly the ones on the north, uh, A, B, and C. Uh, District D grows too, and the Sikan core is built in this period. Um, if you take a look to the northern districts here, uh, you can see the difference with uh, early Sikan. Uh, this grow, um, there's more, uh, sorry, there's more uh, population here and D grows as well. Um, so um, the Sikan uh, core, what I call the Sikan core and the major wakas and waka groups were built during this period. Um, I did not focus uh, this talk on the urban layout, but we did map all the uh, architecture, both monumental and uh, the domestic mounds uh, in the whole area. Um, but I just want to point out that in the greater Sikan layout, we found uh, 17 architectural complexes. Um, each of them uh, have a monumental architecture, uh, probably of a ceremonial aspect. And th those were uh, pyramid pyramidal platforms, all in different shapes, uh, as you can see. Um, all of them had an open space or plaza associated, uh, presumably for uh, public activities. Uh, all of them are associated with cemetery. Uh, there's craft production happening and uh, there's uh, residential uh, occupation associated. So uh, what happens when we overlay these two maps of uh, demographics and architecture? Uh, we have uh, this. <clears throat> Um, in a quick comparison between demographic clusters um, found and the architectural complexes mapped, it is clear that uh, there is demographic clustering around monumental architecture and platforms within each district suggest that ritual and elite residences were important. Um, these architectural complexes might have served as focal nodes, as Hudson point out, or nexus as uh, Pacifico and Trex uh, and notes out uh, since they facilitate the uh, social interaction that structures life in neighborhoods and districts. And here you can see a little bit, um, well, this is the uh, La Leche River. Uh, those are the demographic uh, um, districts. And here is the Sikan core. This is Wakaloro for reference. These are the other Wakas, the pyramid um, <clears throat> complex is what I call it. And here is district D what is the platform complex, as I called it, and it's where uh, the people, uh, uh, basically uh, the elite people lived. Um, and uh, I believe that District D is what uh, actually um, people, the elites living in District D are the ones who uh, acquire power um, and um, during the middle Sikhan period and became uh, <coughs> a transition to a state polity level. <coughs> Um, the Sikan, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the Sikan demographic distribution shows several peaks and not just a single one, um, leading me to argue that uh, the Sikan is a multi-centric city with eight demographic districts, each one presenting representing a large social group, um, most likely focused around an elite lineage. Uh, encompassing also a large array of affiliate households in the form of, fo of followers or uh, retainers. <clears throat> and now for late Sikan, uh, the area was not abandoned in the late Sikan period as was uh, hypothesized uh, previously by Shimada and his colleagues who state that uh, the area was abandoned and people moved to, the, uh, to Tukme. Uh, on the contrary, it continued to be occupied with a large population up to the Chimu and Late Horizon period. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so, um, the basic organizational model at the height of the Sikan city during the middle Sikan period is the Sikan core, that is a civic ceremonial core with regal and public functions surrounded um, by the um, 
Um, Um, <clears throat> the basic organizational model at the height of the Sikan city uh, is the Sikan core uh, with a civic ceremonial core with regal and public functions surrounded by the greater Sikan um, and extensive low density urban sprawl uh, with demographic clustering around subsidiary um, civic complexes with higher ranking households forming districts. For SICAN, one of the major strategies for community identity construction and maintenance, I think, seems to be the commensal politics through the hosting of ceremonies and feasts by elite uh, district leaders. Um, this strategy creates a community district scale identity, as uh, mentioned by, uh, explained by Knudo and Jaeger. Um, the verse, uh, diverse ceremonies and feasts have also been registered in the Sikan core at a larger uh, city scale <clears throat> and uh, political uh, scale level. These larger ceremonies were attended by people from different districts since uh, the Sikan core had, as we see in um, um, District D, uh, small uh, residential population compared to the other ones, of course. Um, this demographic pattern, I argue, reflects a sociopolitical organization of a segmentary type. Uh, segmentary polities are characterized by having a loose aggregation of districts, which seem to be replications of one another in their political structure. Um, they are characterized for having low degrees of centralization, differentiation, and integration with kinship ascription as one of the major governing uh, principles, as explained by the Momolan. Uh, a segmentary pattern organization has also been found archaeologically in the Laleche Valley for rural Sikan. Um, Hayashida finds that while the intensification and enlargement of the agricultural frontier is inseparable of the Sikan state, uh, water management was more independent, not requiring the direct control of the state. This segmentary organization might be the reason rural settlements show relative stability um, with upheaval uh, political changes. And I would argue that same reason applies to urban Sikan, except for uh, certain elites. Um, so we might expect that as a successor um, to the Mochica, the Sikan would uh, continue a centralizing trend seen in the late Moche, uh, in the Moche five city of Pampa Grande and in the later North Coast capital of Chan Chan. However, as I have shown in this talk, social political integration and centralization at Sikan are relative. Uh, the evidence presented in this talk shows that the Sikan city is formed by the Sikan core, a civic ceremonial center um, surrounded by uh, the greater Sikan. <clears throat> um, an extensive low density permanent urban center. The Sikan city demographic pattern with numerous residential clusters around wakas or waka groups is indicative of its multicentric organization. So finally, uh, that the pre-Hispanic North Coast uh, populations uh, may have shifted so rapidly uh, between alternative modes of sociopolitical integration uh, from a very compact uh, pattern in Pampa Grande to a segmentary pattern in Sikan, back to a, a compact pattern in Chan Chan, uh, provides a new window on the dynamism of pre-Hispanic sociopolitical organization and integration, as well as new insights uh, on Andean urbanism. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Gabriela, for that amazing talk. So we're going to give some minutes to people. If they have any question, please type in the Q&A button, and we're going to resolve it here.
Okay, feel free if you have any question, methodological, theoretical comments, we will appreciate. In the meanwhile, I can explain that I was part of that project. So it was a good time with a lot of vegetation and animals like these foxes. So, and definitely there's a lot of things to do in this valley and this period. So it, this is just the beginning of the survey. So probably what is the next stage are you thinking to have uh, Gabriela or what is the next expectation for this kind of a study in cities and ancient? In the ancient um, first um, Well, um, there, there are several things that I'd like uh, to do. and. Um, um, I've talked about a lot of the residential mounds and um, uh, we categorize them as residential mounds just because of the size and all the materials on surface that were uh, cl a clear indication of their nature. Um, but uh, what I'd like to do in the future is uh, go back to the field and have a small sample of this uh, mounds excavated, maybe two, maybe a couple, just for comparison, uh, to excavate them and, and to find out uh, in detail um, uh, what is the, the internal structure, uh, what other materials were uh, in there. Um, overall, uh, uh, a lot of people ask me and say, you got all this information only on surface? Uh, uh, and yes, I did not excavate a single thing. Uh, everything was in surface. There's tons of uh, uh, materials on surface as, as John is a witness and um, so we can do a lot of uh, with uh, surface uh, material and survey um, uh, yet uh, there are some things that uh, would be uh, necessary would need uh, uh, excavation we know now have located those amounts where they are what they are in relation to uh, those uh, canals that is of course an important source of uh, water source um, uh, so I'd like to uh, uh, excavate a couple and, and see them in detail and get also um, um, radiocarbon dates um, and uh, get a more detailed um, 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 view of uh, what is happening there. Um, let me remind you that I said that uh, no uh, houses or households have been um, you know, excavated in, in the, within the second uh, city. Uh, so we don't know uh, uh, how they look in, in, the, in the inside and uh, what other activities that might have uh, happened there. So that's, that'll be a uh, uh, first next step uh, among, among others. Okay, thank you. We have uh, a question from, mm -hmm. from Charles Hastings. So let me read you that. Uh, excellent presentation. Your discussion of segmentation remind me, of course, of the interpretation of segmentation of construction units of Waka del Sol by Mike Mosley and me in 1973. Might some segmentation of, of Middle Seacan society by a continuation, or perhaps revival of segmentation of few centuries early in the Moche Valley? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, it is interesting. Um, I do believe that uh, there are uh, more things happening um, in the different um, valleys uh, that we uh, think of. Uh, so there's more change and variation uh, comparing what are, are uh, is happening in the in the different valleys. Uh, let's remind that uh, at the Moche uh, um, city uh, that we have in the nearest valley here uh, is uh, Pampa Grande. And Pampa, Pampa Grande already is, is, uh, has um, this sort of uh, segmentation in, in uh, a part of the architecture. Um, so it, it something is starting to happen. And I think uh, maybe it's a response. It's a social reaction to a very tight, you know, Pampa Grande, one waka, one big waka, huge. Um, and um, and so maybe it's uh, according to uh, <coughs> um, <coughs> what, oh my God, his name left me. Um, he uh, works in the Mocho Valley in Galindo. Help me with his last name. I forgot him. Anyway, um, uh, this author uh, believes that at, at you know uh, at, at some point the moche uh, begins uh, to uh, have so much pressure um, um, 
in terms of uh, political pressure, but social pressure, and that that would lead to uh, some uh, profound social changes. And I think the response to that is what we're seeing in this decentralization um, uh, that is happening for uh, for Sikan. So um, I think something is stirring in in uh, in late Moche, uh, but it is definitely manifesting uh, clearly and 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 in ex extensively uh, during the uh, Sikan period. Okay. Uh, well, just Charles Hastings is replying. Is Gart Bowden? Maybe? Yes, yes. Thank you uh, so okay. much. And I'm sorry. Of course, it's Gart Bowden. Yes. Okay. The next question um, is from Stephen. Should, should I stop sharing? I guess I can stop sharing. My yeah. Account. Of course. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I okay. Think. Our next yes. question is from Stephen Rue. You mentioned that you faith that you favorite the 43 sites, sites which have only Sikan pottery. Could you explain why you choose not to include other sites if they have mixed Sikan and non Sikan pottery? Do you believe that that represents elite importation or the migration of people to the greater Sikan? Um, okay, there are several questions there. Um, so first of all, I analyze everything. Uh, we analyze the materials of every thing and, and that adds up to um, more than 70,000 uh, um, shirts and 100 boxes of shirts and that took like uh, nine months only to analyze and John was there. Um, so we analyzed everything. Um, why I favored um, these 43 um, mounds who had only um, uh, Sikan ceramics, it's because in order to get the Sikan uh, mound index, in order to calculate uh, population densities for the Sikan period uh, because they did not have other occupations. Other uh, mounds had a uh, formative occupation, there's Mochi occupation, there's Chimu uh, occupations, uh, and those were um, uh, taken into account. But to calculate that um, index, I preferred those that were exclusively Sikan, uh, not to bias uh, my understanding of, of the extension and the characteristics of the Sikan occupation for this uh, period. For the other periods, that is a different story. Um, what was the second question? I'm sorry. Yeah. Is if they have mixed Sikan and non Sikan pottery, do you believe that that represents elite importation or the migration of people to the greater Sikan? Um, Oh yeah, I'm seeing. I'm seeing your uh, in the chat now. Um, uh, so yeah, no, it, I, I'm talking about a period, periods of time, and um, so um, uh, this talk is based only on Sikan, and uh, I've talked about uh, early, middle, and late Sikan. That doesn't mean that uh, there was not a uh, the, the the area was not populated earlier. Uh, uh, because this was a, a survey, uh, we recovered materials from the whole complete um, uh, social trajectory. So uh, yes, uh, we documented uh, formative, uh, moche, uh, sikan, and uh, uh, chimu, uh, chimu inca, and even colonial. Uh, and I've done uh, those analyses as well. <laughs> and uh, uh, those uh, demographic analysis, yes, those were part of my um, dissertation. So there, the area was populated through, you know, the whole uh, uh, time um, since the formative period till the colonial period, and um, it's not populated now. Uh, it was probably depopulated only uh, until the colonial times, with all the, you know, uh, modifications uh, that uh, colonial rule imposed. Um, um, and uh, since then, it, the area uh, seemed to have been abandoned uh, at a time. Uh, and in Republican time, it was part of a big hacienda uh, where basically uh, cattle uh, was meandering and eating there. Um, and uh, later on, um, it was declared a sanctuary, a natural, a natural and historical sanctuary. So it's only now that it's empty and deserted and we see all the trees had to have, have, have grown and cover all this area, but it was populated since the formative times. Okay, Stephen Drew also types. I see, thank you. 
uh, have misunderstood Sikan pottery to mean a style rather than a period. Please come up. <clears throat> okay, we have another question from Larry Cohen. Uh, from what you know about comparative review of other culture, how does the political structure of segmentary cities tend to differ from that of unified cities? Um, well, in general, um, um, and this is not, you know, every all the time, but um, um, I have mentioned that um, um, segmentary, uh, um, low density uh, cities, uh, spread uh, cities um, tend to have a more segmented um, um, uh, social organization and integration. Uh, whereas uh, compact cities such as Pampa Grande, the, the epitome of a compact city in the Andes, um, has a, a, a more uh, direct control and um, and uh, and not not segmentary at all, but you but uh, the, the contrary, unified our powers. So there's one a single uh, family or lineage uh, or person who has um, all the powers. So uh, in comparison uh, abroad, the Andes, that's what I brought in uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Mesoamerica. Uh, Teotihuacan would be uh, you know, a compact city, a unitary uh, um, uh, political uh, system. Uh, whereas um, uh, the Maya cities, uh, for example, having uh, several um, uh, uh, is prowl and a more segmentary um, occupation tend to be more segmentary um, um, and fragmented politically. And this has been mentioned by, uh, not by me, but by uh, uh, researchers, uh, Mayanists, and also uh, Southeast Asia and in Angkor Wat, uh, we have that uh, the, there's replication and segmentation. Um, and uh, um, Kenneth Hirth and Xochilalco also mentions this uh, for this site. Uh, so there are several, um, um, examples uh, comparatively in, in other parts of the world, not just here. I think uh, the thing here uh, that might be a bit shocking is that we think of Andean cities as being very unitary and very centralized. And I think there's more to that. And I think uh, uh, Sikan is a counter example uh, to that as I uh, um, shown. Thank you. Well, <laughs> if we don't have any other questions, so I would like to thank to Dr. Cervantes again for that uh, magnificent presentation. And uh, keep it tuned. We will like go back soon uh, with the brown back lecture series. And thanks to everybody for attending us and joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks. <laughs>